Happy New Year. Happy 2024. Welcome to the Ethics Verse, the coolest place to be every Thursday at noon Eastern. If you are all about improving your company's culture, uh, activating the human sensors in your organization, de-risking your uh, company, and expanding your impact. We have a phenomenal episode for you today. What a way to kick off the year. We're going to be talking about a topic that's near and dear to my heart, one I think is the biggest point of leverage for us uh, on the front lines, and that is about partnering with others inside the organization to expand our impact and push our messages out. So we're going to be talking about building a support network for ethics and compliance and human resources. Couple of housekeeping announcements. You know I love uh, to do a little housekeeping to get started here. Here's our link tree. So this, uh, if you hold up your phone, uh, and you take a picture of this. Uh, if you've never seen a QR code, welcome to 2024. Uh, take a picture of this, and this, this will take you to a page that has all of our links where you can follow Ethico everywhere we're at. So you can check out our YouTube page where we put all the best replays uh, or all the best clips. Uh, we also put those on our LinkedIn page. We, we have replays of our webinars and our uh, fastest growing, not my words, uh, best, not my words again, uh, podcast in the ethics and compliance space called The Ethics Experts. You also can book a demo. You can follow me on LinkedIn and so forth. So if you're not following us everywhere, get familiar. Uh, today, we are going to be giving away this new book from our good friend, our friend of the family, uh, Christy Grant Hart, Your Year as a Wildly Effective Compliance Officer. So what a way to start the year, right? Get this book, uh, plan out your year. If you're not writing your goals down, the odds of those happening are you know, very low, those turn into wishes. So as we're finishing this up, you know, I always like to say our, your network is your net worth. We're going to be talking about that a ton today, but I encourage you to connect with one person in the chat. There's somebody here. Uh, I guarantee there's somebody here uh, who's going through something that you're going through, or maybe just finished a problem that you're dealing with. Our job is to expand our impact. Our job is to de-risk our organizations and drive that culture of integrity forward. You'd get no credit in this life for reinventing the wheel. So reach out to other folks. People are more than happy to help. And a lot of that is talked about in this book. So uh, to kick this year off right, we're giving away 10 because I love you. Okay, we're giving away 10 of these books. So get active in the chat. We're going to be talking about a lot of uh, interesting things. And um, you are going to have some ideas on how, how you can actualize uh, these middle managers more and how to build that network. So so pre please share those and uh, win yourself a great book. Couple of other things. Uh, we have our ROI um, coaching programs. So this is free for Ethics First members. If you're interested in this, if there's a new tool that you'd like and you'd like to meet to craft that ROI, uh, our company has become a little bit famous for uh, this ROI program that we help ethics and compliance and human resource folks uh, with. We're, we do a pretty good job of helping you articulate a talk track to get that, uh, to kind of quantify the impact of whatever it is you're looking for and uh, help you articulate that talk track to get the budget you need or get the approvals you need to get that forward. So if you're interested in that, uh, you can go ahead and drop a one in the chat. And uh, if you want to drop a two in the chat, we're happy to create one of these custom benchmark reports. We did about 200 of those last year. Um, so yeah, it's a great value because it's free. Okay. Uh, ecosystem, this is you know our job as ethics and compliance officers uh, is to crowdsource risk intelligence at scale and provide guidance and provide uh, insights at the point of risk, right? We can't complete that job if we don't have a an enterprise-wide disclosure tool that we can be that circulatory system through, getting information back and focusing our efforts on the biggest risks. Our tool is a next-gen tool. It connects with everything else. It cuts out a bunch of time. So if you're interested in learning some more or seeing what this is all about, what everybody is uh, talking about, uh, go ahead and book a demo. And um, to kick off this year right, we're continuing this forward because we had so much success in Q4. We're giving folks a year free. You know, the biggest risk, or our biggest competitor is inertia and people sticking with the status quo. The biggest uh, impediment for somebody making a change is that fear of change and uh, all the change management that goes along with something that's so, you know, publicly facing, right? It, it, it touches the client experience. So by giving a, a year free, it helps you to get everything dialed in and make that transition super smooth so that when you flip the switch, all your cases are in the new tool. Uh, your numbers just get rerouted and so forth. If you're interested in that, there's a QR code here as well. A uh, couple of other things. Uh, this is a great book. You know, obviously, you don't have to get the Christie book if uh, you win today. Um, this is a great book by Matt Silverman, international bestseller called The Champions Network. This folds directly into our conversation today. If you haven't checked this book out, I encourage you to do so. Ethics and Compliance for Humans uh, from our good friend and friend of the family, Adam Balfour. This book is all about how do you humanize your program? How do you make it a little bit more common sense? So again, you can activate those human centers in the organization. Uh, Speaking Up is awesome. Tom Fox's new book. He just put up another one. Uh, called uh, Compliance Kids Save the World. It's the number, it's the third book in the series. Encourage you to check that out. And then of course, 
the one and only Mary Shirley's book that is uh, one of the biggest bestsellers maybe ever in the ethics and compliance space. Um, 65 Hacks to Level Up Your Ethics and Compliance Program is uh, still there for you. Here's what's coming up on the ethics verse. Bear with me here. You know, this is we had, we were off last week, so I'm a little bit rusty here, but bear with me. Uh, CCOS and CEOs forging an effective C-suite bond. That's coming up. Uh, so I encourage you to join us for that. And then we're going to be talking about equity, inclusion, and the bottom line, sustainable IEDB strategy. Of course, I am Nick. Good to see you all. Chief Servant at Ethico. Do I look like I am ready for 2024 or what? I mean, my gosh, I am cybernetic and I'm ready to go get it. I have that look in my eye and a round of applause for Elizabeth Simon. So Elizabeth uh, most recently held the position of VP of compliance at First Key Homes. It was a single family a home rental company based in Atlanta. She was responsible for developing and implementing uh, the compliance initiatives to ensure First Key Homes activities were compliant with all the laws and regulations. And she was also in charge of the privacy program uh, and enterprise risk management program. So she is what we call a uh, walking hat rack, okay? She championed the environmental, social, and governments program at the company. In addition, she served on uh, the as the executive champion for the Women's Integrated Network Resource Group and was part of the Diversity and uh, Equity and Inclusion Council. How long is your resume? Is that like a, uh, it's like a legal sheet or something? I mean, that's amazing. It's, it's pretty long, yeah. <laughs> Well, welcome to the Ethics Verse. Super uh, excited to dive in and uh, dive into this um, this presentation together. Of course, everybody in uh, you know all you ethicuties out there. If you have questions, drop those into the chat. If you have ideas, drop those into the chat. And with that, we can get going. Awesome! This is a great topic. I love talking about um, you know championing uh, ethics and compliance programs and building your networks. I think um, one of the things that we did at, at First Key Homes um, with our compliance champions program, we'll get into a lot. But um, before we talk about that, I mean, in general, um, networking is one of the most important things that you'll ever do in your career. And it's also one of the most important things you'll ever do for your compliance program. So I think um, this is a, a hugely important topic, one that's near and dear to my heart for sure, and uh, looking forward to having the discussion around this. Very good. All right, well, why don't you walk us through our, uh, our agenda for this discussion today? Yeah, so this is really um, focusing on what we did at First Key Homes for our Compliance Captains Program. Um, and this is um, kind of a way that you can build your network internally uh, who um, with champions who can really, um, you know, be there for you when you're talking about various different ethics and compliance topics across the company. Um, the way that we were set up at First Key Homes is very similar to, I think, most companies where we have kind of a corporate office and then we have market offices throughout the um, country. And a lot of times there's a huge disconnect between the corporate office and what they think and feel and uh, the, the market offices and what they think and feel. And the, the decisions that are made at the corporate office that flow down into the market offices, a lot of times there's a disconnect between those and the reasoning behind them gets missed and lost and whatnot. So one of the things that we... Uh, really wanted to do was we wanted to find those people in the market offices. These are people who are frontline employees who are really making the money for the company. Let's be honest here. Um, we sit in a, in a corporate office. We're not making the money for the company. It's really those people who are boots on the ground, frontline employees who are actually doing what the company is, you know, made to do. And finding connections with those people uh, has, was hugely beneficial for our compliance program. And it, not just in the, the compliance captain's network, which we'll talk about, but also just generally speaking, getting out there and building those relationships with those people in the front lines helped us in uh, most of the larger cases that we ended up getting into what would have been the hotline, but actually came directly to the compliance office because Amazing. they knew us. They had that relationship with us. They felt comfortable talking to us. They may have even come to us and said, hey, I want to be remain anonymous, but at the same time, we knew who they were. So that was a benefit in and of itself because we could go back to them and we can say, hey, you know, we, we uh, you know, did a little digging. This does look like it has, uh, you know, something we need to dig into even further. 
can you give us a little more information about this? Because we knew who well, it was. Proof, yeah, and it's proof of trust, right? Mm -hmm. So you could serve as that sort of firewall to protect their anonymity and protect their, you know, and and protect them while still getting the information you need. And again, I mean, the reason I love this so much is like, let's just kind of zoom out of this for a quick second, right? Uh, the industry benchmarks, ours and Navex, are 3.5 reports per 100 or 1.5 reports per 100, okay? So that's what's out there. That's what we're shooting for. Yet we know that something like, you know, 65% of employees saw wrongdoing last year, potentially uh, reportable items, okay? So that's 65 per 100. And we also know that people are six to eight times more likely to come to their direct manager with something, at least first, before they hit the other, you know, before they hit some of these other channels, whether that's hotline or going to the SEC or the OJ or whatever, right? So there's orders of magnitude more reports. There's orders of magnitude more risk intelligence in the organization. We often feel like we're in goalie syndrome, right? Where we get none of the credit for all the shots we block and we get all the blame for any shots that get past us. For us to be successful ever, we, and for us to ever achieve this goal of being the circulatory system of the organization, we have to be able to crowdsource risk intelligence at scale across the organization. When we can get in front of that stuff quicker, not only can we react faster and focus our attention on the right things, we also have a much more clear view of like the true risk profile of our organization. I mean, how many of us are looking through a pinhole and patting ourselves on the back and looking at a sample of issues that are only between one and a half and three and a half per hundred when there's another 50 out there, 55 out there, right? So engaging these middle managers is the easiest and quickest way for us to level up from this compliance 2.0 program to a 3.0 program where we're viewed as a, you know, strategic lever in the organization. And, you know, Elizabeth had, has done a great job of, you know, giving us the recipe for that. So this is the year where we have to expand our impact and expand our, spo our scope of influence, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And and uh, one of the things that you said triggered something uh, in me. When I first started at First Key Homes, I actually met, I, I set 30 minutes aside with almost every single leader in the company down to the director level. And the directors of these market offices were some of the people that I actually, you know, sat down with and said, hey, where do you see risks in the business? So and smart. that helped us to pull together our enterprise risk assessment in a, a very quick, fa a very quick, 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 quick manner, because I was able to talk to a lot of different people all over the country, all of the, of the different uh, leaders in the company, and pull those risks together into one as you're building out your risk universe. So, not only does it help from a reporting perspective because people feel comfortable coming to you, letting you know what's going on, but it also helps you in building that risk profile that you need. You know, where do you need action on as a compliance team? Well, and, and think about this, like risk assessments are like plans, right? The only thing worse than a bad plan is no plan. The only thing worse than a bad risk assessment is no risk assessment. And we know that, in a, that a risk assessment process is an iterative process, right? That's going to be an mm -hmm. ongoing thing. And so what Elizabeth was, was able to do, obviously, is crowdsource a bunch of intelligence for that risk assessment that's something to get started with. You're always going to be tweaking those things, and you're always going to say, okay, well, you know, you're always going to find you know, risks uh, that frontline folks might say are massive that you, with your broader purview, are able to say, okay, that's actually contained, or we have other backstops here. But again, you're getting folks engaged, you're helping to get that plan built a lot faster, and you're not you know, doing it myopically from, you know, a single perspective, you're gathering more of those of those different viewpoints from these different, you know, departments. Absolutely. Absolutely. And then another one of the things that I uh, was able to do is actually go and visit these market offices. I wasn't able to visit every single one of them, but we did um, probably four to six a year. And we did it kind of like, uh, you know, that show the undercover boss where yes. like, the CEO goes and like works alongside frontline employees and whatnot. Yeah. Well, it wasn't undercover because I knew who I was and I wasn't the CEO and I wasn't their boss. So it wasn't really undercover boss, but it was that same concept where were I you, went. Were you able to wear a wig or no, a disguise? <laughs> no, no, that would have been cool though. Or if I had my little AI thing, that would have been even cooler. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Yeah, no, but um, but I, I, you know, actually rode with them to the different homes, watched them and learned along with them. I, I learned how to change out faucets. I learned how to, uh, you know, all these different maintenance things that our guys have to do out, our guys and gals have to do out in the field to, to help uh, maintain these homes. I was right there along with them. They were showing me how to do it. They were showing me what their challenges were on a daily basis. And that helped me to really understand how to communicate 
with these people because there's a very right. different method of communication with someone sitting in front of a computer all day long versus someone who is in a van driving from home to home, doesn't ever right. touch their email. Uh, and so it was, we were able to use that information to, um, you know, uh, be more effective in some of the initiatives that we had from a compliance perspective. Um, yeah. I mean, there's nothing like walking in those shoes for a moment and getting, I, I mean, there was probably so many like light bulbs that went on when you just got to see what someone's day to day, you know, you have these folks that are out on the front lines and all this stuff, and you're trying to like impose this guidance and trying to, pro you know, provide these insights at these points of risk. And many times we don't even know what that day to day looks like, you know, going to the bathroom yeah. at Starbucks or, you know what I'm saying? Like, what is that actually like every single day? Seeing it gives you a much better picture of like, well, what true risks are they dealing with? And what is the reality like? Now I can provide guidance, you know, again, back to, you know, some of those concepts in Adam Balfour's book. Now I can provide guidance that's more common sense, that's more actionable, that people can actually do something with to help me achieve my goal of de-risking the organization and getting more of that risk intelligence. It's just phenomenal. Yeah. So, I mean, one of know, the, re really quickly, one of the examples that I'll give is, and it's a, it's a benefit that everybody wants, right? Let's say um, corporate wants to do summer hours. Everybody likes summer hours, right? You, you get to leave early right. on Friday if you make up your hours, you know, the rest of the week or whatever. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. in looking at, you know, being able to participate in what the front line was working on, we realized a couple of things. One, summer is the busiest time of the year. Two, the last four hours of Friday is the busiest time of the week. It's impossible right. for them to take that time off. And also, when corporate is taking that time off, then they don't have the support that they need from the people at corporate that they need to, you know, to, to get right. their jobs done. And so we had to, knowing all of what we knew from those visits and learning, you know, what they do on a daily basis, we were able to go back. And whilst it was still very difficult for them to participate in summer hours, we were able to make some suggestions on how they could do it, maybe not the last four hours of Friday or, you know, sometime during the week or, or spread it out or something like that right. so that they would have a m more likely chance of participating than if we had just sent an email that said, okay, everybody, you can have summer hours on the last four hours of Friday. Yeah. And it also kind of like dials in the why behind the what versus just saying, no, we can't do it. Well, now I have a relationship. Now we have a conversation going and now I can express the why, why you can't part participate in those at those particular times. Uh, Terry Stringer. Hey, Terry, how's it going? Um, Terry had a great question here. What was their reaction when you first approach, when you first approached them with this ride along idea? Were they suspicious that you were kind of trying to spy on them? How did you, and that was probably kind of by person by person, how were you able to overcome that sort of elephant in the room or elephant in the car? Yeah, no, that's a really, really great question. And we did have some of those people who were like, why are you here with me <laughs> type of thing. But what we did was we prepped the, um, office manager, the, the district operations director, who is a leader of that office, uh, and just tell, told them, like, this is what we're planning on doing for our trip, for our visit. Um, and this is this is the, kind of the reason behind it. We want everyone to be open and, and honest. We want to really just build relationships. We want to learn what you do so that it can help us as we are, you know, pushing out compliance initiatives so that they can be uh, easier for your teams to you know, action on or whatever. So and, it was really a matter of prepping. Well, and, you know, you touched on something that I think is uh, both a, a threat and an opportunity for us, right? The threat, the negative aspect is that many ethics and compliance departments have like a really bad brand, right? Everybody hates compliance. Okay. I'm being a little dramatic here, but everybody hates compliance. So how can you use that broad stereotype to your own advantage and turn that into an opportunity? Well, I think the, one of the best ways to define who you are is by defining who you're not. And so mm -hmm. what, in, what a great way to kind of show that like you're the antithesis of this stereotype by saying, hey, we don't want our organization to have a compliance department that's just like everybody else's. That's like a hall monitor. That's like a cop that no one feels they can come to. Our job is to enable the business to drive down the road of commerce a lot faster. And in order for us to do that, we have to understand what folks are dealing with so that we're not like you know, overloading you with things that are not germane to your job and that we can have a better, to your point, a better picture of what actually, you know, what, what is actually pertinent and what's actually going to move the, the, the needle. So if we have this sort of negative stereotype, it's very easy because, you know, people are all, you know, um, 
subject to these same sort of mental shortcuts, it's very easy to reframe who we are. And it's very easy with a couple of interaction points to show that we are materially different than the stereotype that they have in their mind. That is like the fastest way to get people onto your side. When somebody feels like, you know, if you've ever met somebody or if you've ever, ever, ever been introduced to somebody and your friend is like, you're going to hate this person and you kind of walk into it, you know, and you're like, this guy's kind of a piece of garbage. And then you talk to him for a while and you're like, wow, I actually like this guy. I find myself going out of my way to make sure that like I counterbalance that that missed impression that I have. So that when I introduce that person, I'm like, you're going to love this guy because I don't want someone else to kind of go through that same thing. These all, all these mental shortcuts and all these uh, all these behavioral psychology opportunities are out there in the human beings within our organization. Again, we just have to make some small tweaks on how we address those folks. So Elizabeth, when we're talking, you know, we spent a lot of time in our pre-show talking about the business case. Let's talk a little bit about how this business case was made so successfully and how you were able to get the endorsement to, you know, push this uh, compliance captains program forward. Yeah, absolutely. So there are several different things that we did when we were trying to build the business case. And part of it came from the fact that we already knew a lot of the people that were going to be involved. So um, I had a, a relationship with our operations um, VP. I had a relationship with a lot of the um, district operations directors who, again, are, were the, the, like the leaders in the, in the market offices. Uh, and um, with the regional vice presidents who are kind of over the, the operations as well. And so having had already built those relationships with those people, um, we were able to go to them and say, hey, we have this idea. We really want to be able to connect with your teams uh, and make sure that they are aware of compliance issues and risks and, and how the business is addressing them. And um, you know, that we have a hotline, all of those types of things. And we would really like to have, uh, you know, one person per market office that's dedicated, not dedicated, that, that has kind of a, a role as the compliance, we call them the compliance champion um, or compliance captain is what we ended up calling it. And uh, they would be our point of contact for providing you with, you know, compliance topics or information or heads up on, you know, this training is coming or whatever. And then they would be able to better disseminate the information to the rest of the people that uh, reported up through that office. Uh, and so by building those relationships ahead of time, we were able to go to them and, you know, present the idea uh, of the compliance captains program and and gain some buy-in from them before we even went any further down the road. Um, and then a lot of the points that you had already mentioned, Nick, I mean, compliance is a part of the, the business. If we, if we do business right, then it, it, we're gonna have a lot better outcomes in the long run. If we right. uh, show that we are trusted, then those issues are going to come to us sooner rather than blowing, you know, into a big problem that is going to be a lot more difficult to solve. You know, those are, are, are huge issues that a company needs to be addressing uh, with their compliance program so that um, they can catch things before they, they blow up right. into, into bigger issues. So um, a lot of those came into on as well. here. Oh, sorry. You, you have a bullet on here about metrics and statistics from your program and linking it to values. Can you tell us some tips or, like, that sounds great. That's a great bullet. How, how, how do you actually do that? And like, what pitfalls did you maybe encounter? Or, you know, what would you kind of share with folks uh, so that they can avoid pitfalls in trying to hit those two bullets, the metrics one and tying it to values? Yeah, I mean, the metrics one, a lot of it came from the hotline, it came from training, it came from the typical types of metrics that you would present to the board, for example. But we also, uh, at First Key, we also um, did a lot of operational related metrics. So we would, we, we right. had compliance monitoring set up in place for um, various different laws and regulations that directly impacted operations. And so we were able to pull, draw from that, the program that we already had, the monitoring that we already had in place to pull some of those um, metrics and statistics from the program. We also used data to determine how many compliance captains we needed in any part of the business. So mm -hmm. if we had a larger office, uh, then we might've needed more than one uh, compliance captain because, um, or, or if we had a huge, uh, department within one of the offices. We may have needed a, a different compliance captain 
for that department. So that also uh, went into kind of developing the program and then linking it to the values. Again, it's really about, you know, what is compliance here for? Compliance is here to, to make sure that we as a company are living our values. And, right. um, you know, each one of those values is going to be something that compliance should be looking at, should be monitoring, should be assisting the business in, uh, you know, ensuring that people are are adopting those values as their own um, uh, through whether it be uh, monitoring through the hotline or monitoring through uh, various other different ways, you know, the, the monitoring that I was talking about before. So this might be getting a little bit detailed, but how often were you presenting these statistics and how often were you tying in the values in those presentations? Was that through a memo? Was that through a, a presentation to some executive team or something like that? And what kind of like what kind of headwinds did you hit, if any, along the way of launching this program? So the metrics, uh, they're, they're kind of separate and together with the program itself. So that we, would, we had a monthly compliance uh, meeting with our leadership team that we would present some of the metrics that we did on our, in our compliance monitoring program. Um, and then, so we could we could pull information from that if we needed to when we were when we were building that business case, um, and then also we present at the quarterly audit committee meetings as well. So um, any any compliance monitoring results that we uh, had that came out of our monitoring program would be already presented in several places. So it was very easy for us to pull those together cool. into the business case when we were building it. And then when you were getting approval to launch this program, I can't imagine leadership was like monolithic in their support. There was probably a distribution of people that some people were like, they saw it immediately and they're like, absolutely do it. And then there were probably others that like, this seems like a waste of time. People have what they need. Correct. Okay, great. So how long did it take for these sort of like naysayers to get the buy-in? And what was it that turned those light bulbs on in your experience the, you know, most effectively? Yeah, the interesting thing is we, we first presented it to the SVP of operations and she was uh, less than excited about the idea. Um, she actually said, we don't have time for this. There's not time for somebody to dedicate off the side of their desk to do something like this. Um, and we initially had some pushback. Um, but what we ended up doing is because, again, we had that relationship with the regional vice presidents, we you know, kind of floated the idea to them and they were on board because they awesome. were closer to the operations. So they saw the value of the program and the need for it. And so they and you had were already able... started to build relationships with those folks. Right, right. Even before yeah. we thought about like yeah, putting, yeah. Out, putting this um, program in place. Right. So we already had those relationships with, the, with them. We floated the idea. They were excited about it. Um, and the other thing is like, the Department of Justice kind of expects it now. I mean, it used totally. to be a suggestion. Totally. Now, in the latest guidance, it says you know it needs to be there and it needs to be uh, you know an op option for people uh, as they're you know advancing their in their careers and things like that. And so, we presented it as kind of a uh, another way for people to show that they are worthy of you know the next promotion up or, or other things like that. We right. kind of wove into the program and we told the regional vice presidents about it and they were very excited. And so they were able to uh, sway the, the, the SVPs, you know, view of it and we were able to uh, launch it. Yeah. And it's not just one person singing the song, you, it's a whole chorus of people singing the song. That's a lot easier to get someone to at least kind of try it out. Did she become a believer, this SVP at some point? Was she like, this is better? Or was she always kind of a little lukewarm on it? Yeah. Yeah. I think once the, once the, program rolled out and she saw that it wasn't, you know, a huge burden. It wasn't as big as she folks. thought it was. Yeah, yep. yeah, yeah. Then she became a believer. So this DOJ thing that Elizabeth just brought up, I just, you know, we've been talking about this for a couple of years. People thought we were super crazy about it. I'll, I'll go out there and say that, like, it's impossible to do your job effectively if you don't have something like this out there. I'm not saying you have to necessarily have a formalized program, but you have to absolutely have an informal network of relationships to Elizabeth's point in order to get this risk intelligence. Because again, I'm not talking, you know, we're not talking about, you know, we're at 90, 95% of uh, the limit of what's available from a risk intelligence perspective. We're at like 10% of it, 5% of it. So there's so much more out there and um, it's, it's on you to go, go and make this happen. And I appreciate you being so candid and transparent, Elizabeth, with this process, because I think there's a lot of lessons in this. You know, we see an idea like this and we're like, this is awesome. I, if I could wave a magic wand, 
I'm bought in. I would love for this to happen. But you're, we're always going to be hitting impediments when we need that kind of buy in. And you've shared some kind of some pretty, you know, succinct examples of how you you were able to get the buy in from somebody who maybe was, wasn't initially as excited about it as, you know, you or others were. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'd love to hear from uh, on the chat, like what, if you have a program, sure, there are a lot of people out there, especially with the, the recently updated, you know, DOJ's guidance back in March of last year uh, that, you know, it is kind of expected now that you have a program. You know, what did you do to build your business case? Was there anything else that I didn't mention that you used to, to build your business case? Were there other um you know, roadblocks that you saw that you were able to overcome or haven't been able to overcome and maybe need some suggestions from other people. I mean, this is one of the best things about having, uh, you know, sessions like this is is learning from other people, learning from not just us as the presenters, but learning from the audience right. and the participants as exactly. well. So if you have a program in place and you uh, had, you know, some challenges or you were building business cases or whatnot, then I, we would love to hear in the chat, um, you know, how you overcame them. Yeah, please drop those in. Let me share what Mary Jo just uh, dropped in. Hey, Mary Jo. Um, when I pitched a compliance ambassador program, I communicated the development opportunity it represented to the individuals in the business. I think this is such an important one. You know, uh, Elizabeth just kind of alluded to this a moment ago, but in organization, whatever, leadership, they want to stack their team with impact players with A players. And this is a great opportunity for someone to show that they're an impact player by taking on more outside of their, you know, strict job description of whatever they responded to on Indeed or whatever, uh, for them to make that kind of an impact. So that kind of helps to satisfy the development opportunity from the company perspective. But from the individual perspective, like if you look at the hierarchy of values of what people in today's generation are, I'm not just talking about Gen Z or Gen Alpha or whatever, well, I guess I guess Gen Alphas are not working yet in our uh, country, hopefully. Um, but what folks are looking for across generations in today's workplace is they want more development opportunities. And this is a great free development opportunity for someone to step into sort of a quasi management position to own something in their local environment to build some of those management muscles that they're eventually going to need if and when they get promoted. So there's a smart way to kind of pitch this, I think, you know, and I'm just kind of buying a little time as we get some more answers from folks in the uh, chat here, uh, a little inside baseball for you. But there's a really smart way to kind of thread both of those needles and appease both of the audiences uh, whose buy in is necessary for this thing to be successful. Yeah, I think, you know, especially with the frontline employees, a lot of them, they're all their jobs are all the same, right? Their their goals right. are all the same. Their performance management is all the same. In order for them to really stand out, if they have something like this off the side of their desk, that can really make them stand out and really be, you know, the, the difference between them and somebody else in getting a promotion. So I think this is a, a really good opportunity from a development perspective for individuals, especially on the front line. Erica just dropped in. We pull, we pull a list of providers from human resources and add them to our COI system. So the system will generate disclosures for them uh, to complete, to capture potential conflicts of interest. It's difficult to keep track of all providers with this, with a huge hospital system. So that's a way that they've sort of been able to use some, some technology to, uh, you know, crowdsource some more of that risk intelligence. I'm going to go back to Mary Jo's comment. Um, where'd it go? Oh, um, Patrick asked Mary Jo, you know, how is it perceived when you pitch the compliance ambassador program? And what she responded with was, uh, I presented the program to leadership team, uh, treating the role like a regular posting, had a job description and clear outline of responsibilities. There are always rising stars flagged in an organization. It was approved at the first, it, it wasn't approved at the first go, but continuing to build the job description definitely helped. So again, it's an iterative process. Uh, and you just got to get started because to Mary Jo's point, there are rising stars in the organization. There are people that are trying to, uh, that are not in compliance, that want to see the world better, that want to make the world better, that want to leave it better for the people that are, are coming. And everybody in the organization today cares about having a culture of integrity and, and they're willing to pick up a bucket and start bailing some, some of the water out of it. You know what I mean? You have to just take some steps to, um, to actualize those, those people. I want to share one other thing here from Terry. Uh, we are implementing a pilot ambassador program now. We received initial pushback on the implementation because we already had a liaison program. However, the liaison program are higher level individuals. We had to convince our leaders that we are missing a link at the peer-to-peer -peer level. 
Round of applause for Terry. This is so smart. Absolutely. Therefore, we are focusing our programs on recruiting individual contributors as ambassadors. Don't let the pushback. No doesn't mean no. No means not yet. Remember that. Uh, I'm glad my wife isn't on here. Um, well, she knows that already. Uh, no is not no. No means not yet. So when you hit those inevitable impediments, there's always a way over, around, under, and through. You can pick any lock. You just have to usually reframe it. And I think Terry did a really smart job of showing some of the nuance and describing what problem this ambassador program is going to solve relative to what the liaison program was in place. Look, at some point, we want everyone to be, you know, a you know de facto uh, compliance champion, right, or a compliance captain in, in the organization. But you have to kind of phase into it. Yeah, another comment in the chat was what benefits have been most appealing for employees? And I had mentioned some of them before, but, um, you know, kind of looking at, I don't know if everyone has heard of the whole concept of pie, uh, where your career development is really um, driven by three things, performance, image, and exposure. Uh, and as you're lower, you're earlier on in your career, performance is a really, really important thing. But as you grow in your career, performance becomes much less important and exposure, image and exposure become much more important. And so what we tried to do with our program once we launched it is we, pro we tried to provide those compliance captains so with exposure to various different people that may, they may not have had exposure to. So we had a monthly meeting and we had one of our leaders, uh, C-suite level uh, or right below C-suite level leaders attend the meeting um, and, you know, introduce themselves to everyone. Uh, they kind of, uh, in, in, you know, t told them about the importance of the role of the compliance captain and why it was, it was so good for the company and, you know, provided them with some accolades and thanks and whatnot about for them doing mm -hmm. it because we know it's all off the side of their desk. So they got a little bit of exposure to some of these senior leaders that they may not have gotten uh, exposure to if they hadn't uh, participated in the program. Um, we also had, the, like I said, the monthly meetings so we could give kind of a sense of community. And we had a Teams chat that we uh, set up so that Mark. people could, could kind of could continue the conversation. Um, and then at performance evaluation time, we provided their leaders with uh, additional recognition and support so that they could add that into their performance management process. Um, and, and again, kind of differentiate themselves from other people that may be peers of them that didn't participate in the program. So um, giving them a little bit of recognition and support. Um, and then also we had a, um, at the beginning of each meeting, we had like a compliance captains of the month type of situation so where we would recognize uh, one person, talk about some of the different things that they did uh, and, and provide them with recognition within the, the compliance captains community, as well as while that senior leader was still on. Um, and then we, we, of course, everybody loves swag. So we, uh, we gave them a, a mug that had like the compliance captain's logo on it um, and uh, try to to provide them with something that would show other people that they are participating in the program. So cool. So smart. Um, I've never heard that pie thing, but consider that stolen. OK, that is stolen. <laughs> yeah, I use that uh, one all the time when I'm doing uh, professional development type or individual uh, you know, career development uh, sessions. Love it. I think it's so true. <laughs> I mean, but how interesting is that? Not to uh, rabbit hole us too much, but look at the proportion that's actually driven by performance. It's probably right. I mean, that's probably directionally right. Just that exposure, just kind of being in front of folks that are higher level up, you know, you want your name spoken in rooms that you're not in, in a good yep. way, right? So yep. getting that exposure gives you more of those those development opportunities, more of those um, those development opportunities. Did I say well, development why... twice? Yeah, that's why networking right. is so important, right? Because that's where your exposure right. comes from. If you're networking, you're getting exposure to those people. They're getting exposure to you. Uh, they're going to remember right. you as long as you are, you know, bright, intelligent, and, uh, you know, are, are, you know, doing what they think you should do. So uh, right. exposure is definitely a huge percentage of the pie of what uh, helps advance your career. Um, unique, unique perspective alert just came in. I haven't even read this yet, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, run it. Am I still live? You hear me? Okay. Uh, Michelle. Hey, Michelle. Unique perspective alert. I took over Elizabeth's program at a prior company. She spent years building the groundwork and educating the business partners on the value of engaging with compliance as a partner. She was always so helpful in getting the business teams 
to the resources they needed after identifying risk. It takes a long time to build trust with the business and one bad experience can break it. I'm grateful that I had a great baseline of trust to start with. How phenomenal is that? Uh, you really set up the, you know, you, you really set others up for success. Um, you know, when you can be thoughtful about how you engage and build this network within the organization. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks so much, Michelle. All right. So for those folks who do have a program, I would love to hear how you incentivize your ambassadors. The, um, the, I forget who it was that said it, maybe Terry uh, earlier about um, having the job description uh, for their ambassadors. Um, and I don't know if it was actually an official job that that's what they did or if it was off the side of the desk, but what, what other incentive, incentives have you provided to your uh, ambassadors for those who have programs? Great question. Okay, so we'll be waiting for some of those, um, those answers. Beyond, like, were there any ideas on incentives that you had that you weren't able to get approval for? Was there a way that you could incorporate their participation into their annual review or their bonus to get them sort of some extra points? Yeah, I mean, that's this that's the, the best part about this time of year because this is where you're setting goals for the rest of the year, right? So if you right. can get that program launched or get it started early on in the year when the, the compliance captains have the ability to put that as a goal within their performance management, you're going to have a lot more success with the program because people are, are want they're they're, they're going to do what they're incentivized to do and your performance management is a part of bonus structures is a part of you know all the different types of things whether or not you get a merit raise those types of things so if you can get them early on in the year in order to enable them to have a goal in performance management that you know for the, the compliance captain's program then you're going to have them for the rest of the year. So it'll stick for them for the rest of the year because they want to make sure they hit those goals. So that's one of the ways to do it. Um, there are spot bonuses, I suppose, some companies can do. Uh, so like when we did the compliance captains of the month, if you could give a spot bonus along with that or something else to incentivize them, um, that is an idea. Um, again, with the swag, some people are, are really, you know, driven by swag, some people aren't. So if you do, like if you give the compliance captains of the month some kind of swag to go with it or, or something to hang up, like a certificate even, that's pretty cheap. Um, uh, that might be a way of incentivizing because it's showing other people uh, what they've done. Um, so those are some other ideas that I had. Um, I, I'd love to hear what others are saying. Um, so there's some answers coming in. Um, one thing I've seen, which I thought was pretty smart and pretty cheap is like getting these little trophies. So you can get these little trophies and put their name on it. Very simple. It's like a little mm -hmm. kind of trophy for the desk and people can sort of stack those up again, like a thousand dollars goes a really long way from an incentive perspective for a program like this. And no one at any organization that's on this podcast or on this webinar can't spend a thousand dollars on this thing. That's going to move the needle potentially extremely significantly. You know what I'm saying? So don't, yeah. you know, get what you need, make the case for what you need, because you probably don't need that much in order to make an impact and sort of close the loop on that, on that incentive, you know, flywheel. You know what I mean? Another um, thing you can do, I just thought of is if marketing happens to have some extra swag from your company, from a different meeting or right. whatever, tap into them and see if they have anything extra that you can use to give out uh, when you have your like compliance captains of the month or, or whatever. Yeah. But if you if you have a stack of like T-shirts from a T-shirt printer that have printed those sideways or something like that, that you just haven't thrown out yet, let's not use those as gifts. OK, no, 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 All no, right. no. <laughs> um, Mary Jo said it was off the side of the desk. Additional responsibilities were in the annual objectives and included in performance reviews. So so she was able to get that kind of integration into annual uh, reviews. Robin said, we're developing our pilot phase, but are talking about offering CEUs for champion meetings and professional development sessions. Great. Uh, give them yeah. a little bit of something for it. Um, Mary Jo, back to Mary Jo. She said specific tactics uh, were required and performance was tracked on what tactics were achieved. Very smart. Um, and finally, Terry said, we're working to provide them access uh, to executive levels, participation in conferences. I also send thank you notes, uh, copying their bosses at the end of the year during performance review time. So mm -hmm. freaking smart. I love that. Yes, we are yes. also planning to create some uh, logoed swag this year. That's so great. I love it. Very smart. Yeah. 
And use your again, use your marketing department to help you with the logo because they already are graphic. They probably have graphic designers in there. They could probably help you, you know, whip up a logo pretty pretty quickly. And marketing has time, believe me. Okay, they're just kind of <laughs> right. they're tinkerers. Okay, I'm just kidding. Just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. Okay. All right. So once once we uh, had the buy-in, once we uh, had figured out what our incentives were going to be, it was a, the next step was really communicating our program, and it was communicating in two different ways: communicating to the organization that we had a program, and then communicating to the ambassadors what we wanted to communicate to them, so that they can communicate out to the rest. So that was a lot of communication, um, but. From a from a communicating to the organization perspective, uh, we um, went through leadership. Uh, so at the leadership's meeting, we uh, talked about the program. We talked about the importance of it. We also um, uh, it recruited leaders to come to those monthly meetings. Uh, we only had uh, when I said that the leaders came to the monthly meetings. They, there was only one leader per monthly meeting, so it wasn't too. Uh, overburdensome for them to come to one, you know, 45 minute meeting right. that they didn't even have to stay on the entire time. Um, <clears throat> so we, we went to the leadership team, we told them about the program, we told them why we were doing it. The why is hugely important. Make sure that you're able to talk about the why um, with the leaders. And then, um, and, and they were able to, as they needed to communicate down through the, through their organizations, but really the communication came through the ambassadors or the, or the, the compliance captains themselves. So we would provide them at the monthly meeting with a monthly topic and with, uh, an, we sent them an email that had links to policies, um, that were applicable links to, um, uh, or a, an attachment of, uh, like a, a one pager that had information about the particular topic that they could print out and put around the office if they wanted to, or they could send it out to people uh, or hand it out to people if they wanted to do it that way. However, it worked best for their office because different offices did different things. Um, and then we had uh, talking points that we also sent out with the email. And so they could go through the talking points. I mean, if they wanted so to, they could go bullet through bullet and just read through it to the people at their meetings, their huddles or whatnot, um, or, or however best worked for them. And then we walked through those resources on that monthly meeting with them. So if they had any questions, they were able to ask those questions so they could feel comfortable about speaking to the topic um, to, to the rest of their office uh, folks. Um. There was a good question that I just lost, so let's just keep going. If I find it, I'll bring it back up. I promise. Uh, so there was a question that, uh, what resources budget did you have to launch the program, and That's how did you argue for it? Um, so we actually had a really, really small budget. And in fact, um, all of the resources that we put together, the one-pagers, we utilized our intern that we have every summer. We get, we get a summer intern. And this particular intern that we had was amazing at graphic design. And so he actually designed uh, a whole year's worth of content for wow. us, our monthly content, uh, the one pagers. Uh, he put together the talking points. So we didn't ha we actually didn't have to spend a whole lot of time doing that. We had our intern pretty much focused. That was his biggest um, task for the summer. Uh, focused on putting together the resources for the year for the compliance captains program. Um, as as far that's as so swag cool. goes, oh, go, go ahead. Do you have a question about that? No, I was just going to say that that's so cool. I mean, how smart, right? You got the whole thing yeah. dialed in, knocked out by somebody who knows what they're doing in that. And then again, it it doesn't look like uh, Nick Gallo made it in Microsoft Word. It looks like a proper sort of graphic design thing that gives some credibility because the eyes eat first. I mean, it's so smart. I love it. it. It was it was incredible. In fact, I didn't know that he had this talent until he started doing this. And when I first saw his first one pager, I was like, did you send this to marketing? Because it looks like something that marketing put together. It was that good. <laughs> wow, that's so good. Yeah, he's very talented. Wherever he ends up landing after law school, he is going to be, one, whoever that company is, is going to be one lucky company for sure. Um, but then as far as the swag goes, we only had um, a $500, like like Nick was saying, $1,000 will go pretty far if you can you know, make it work. We had a $500 budget for swag. Um, so we ended up, uh, we, we originally thought about doing uh, jackets. I don't know if you um, uh, ever read, um, oh gosh, now I can't even remember his name. The, the guy from Airbnb who had the book out uh, several years ago uh, about his compliance ambassadors program. Um, 
and he had jackets. Every compliance ambassador had a jacket. And so they would wear it around and everybody would right. know that they were the compliance ambassador. We thought about doing something like that, but we, we said, you know, like coffee mugs or, or cups like this would, would be something that people could use. Uh, it's also totally. sustainable. So it goes with our ESG program. And uh, it's, you know, if it had the logo on it, then, you know, people would know that they're a compliance captain. So we ended up getting those as the, the, the swag for the um, compliance captains. Everything else we did uh, completely internally. So it was something cool. that was already a part of our regular budget. So $500 uh, to launch the program, basically. 500 bucks. And then somebody asked, I think in the Q&A, they asked, like, what was the count of resources you had in your team to help achieve this? So what was your sort of like base team count? And then how many folks were in this sort of broader program? So that question. Our, yep. Our compliance team consisted of uh, myself and two full-time employees. We also had two contract employees that really focused on a separate area of compliance that was um, a high risk to the company. Uh, and then we had an intern. And like I said, the intern did most of the work for the compliance captains program to, to generate that content for an entire year. Yep. Uh, and so, so essentially it was an intern that was creating almost all of our content for the year. Uh, we have one person who is one of, the, of our full-time people that uh, led that 45 minute meeting every month uh, and explained the, the topic to the, the ambassadors and then it would just, you know, as ambassadors had questions, they would uh, come back to us and, and ask us questions. We didn't, we don't have a large team. So um, it's something that I think just about any compliance program can handle um, if they, yeah. uh, if they, you know, resource it right. And I just want to kind of remind everybody that it's easy to look at, say, oh, well, that's a massive team. And they have all these folks that are, you know, if you're looking at a large company, well, there's also you know, proportionally a lot more people probably in that organization. And so I'm just saying any team, from my experience, any compliance team is usually like a little bit understaffed, like everyone would want more people on their team. And so yeah. I think the point is our job is to solve for the outcome, given the constraints that are in place, many of which are outside of our control. And I think Elizabeth has given us a pretty good, uh, you know, framework here on how we can do exactly that. So I just want to remind everybody that anybody who has a successful uh you know, ambassador program or compliance captains program, they're probably doing it on whatever is a relative uh, shoestring. Um, and they're using their influence and they're using their, you know, their brains and their wit in order to get these people engaged in order to solve for the outcome they want, which is, you know, more participation, more risk intelligence, more actionable insights that we can, you know, focus our efforts on. Yeah. Uh, one other thing I'll, I'll um, respond to on the resources budget thing is, Compliance captains, the number of compliance captains you have, and I guess this can actually kind of go towards the next uh, topic for discussion, and that's selecting and onboarding your ambassadors. The number of ambassadors that you have really depends on the company and how it's structured and how your frontline employees are structured. Um, we had, I think, 25 market offices, and so wow. we wanted to have one compliance captain per market office generally speaking, depending on the size of the office. If, it, if the office was really large, we might want to have more than one. Um, and then we also uh, wanted to ha be able to have, uh, and this was like phase two actually, a compliance captain within the corporate departments as well. So, cool. um, it, it, I mean, but that's really going to depend. 25 might be too much for a company, might be too little, you know, too, too few for a company. So. Uh, it really depends on how your company is structured and, you know, what is the most effective way to get your compliance message out to the most people in your company. And, you know, one other thing, correct me if I'm wrong, but do it, do it nicely, please. Okay. Just kidding. Um, <laughs> it's, it's, it's an ever evolving thing. You know what I'm saying? Whatever your program looks like five years from now is probably not what it's going to look like today. And so I kind of suffer from this sometimes where I get like, you know, this seems like a big problem and a really big project. And I like don't know where to start. And I kind of fall into this analysis paralysis thing of like, you know, and then like nothing gets done. I think just jumping in the pool and starting to learn how to swim, just launching something, starting small, starting local, doing a pilot program before you get the full approval, whatever you can do to get some of that forward motion is going to provide that learning feedback loop, help you get through your J, J curve faster and really kind of start you on this, you know, initiative that 
we know from everybody who's ever done one provides tremendous benefit to every compliance team that, you know, has one of these in place. I mean, it's going to happen. The benefit will come for sure. Um, it's not like you're scattering, you know, seeds on a parking lot, right? Like these things are going to grow and it's going to give you some, some of those benefits that you envision. You just have to get started though. You know, don't, yeah. so I'm just oh, saying, absolutely. don't like over, yeah, I'm just going to keep rambling through this. So I'm just going to say this three more times. Uh, don't let the size of what you see other companies, you know, programs that they have in place prevent you from just getting started and taking those first steps. Yeah, I agree 100%. And that goes for a compliance program too. If you're just starting a compliance Good program, point. you have to, you're not going to have all seven elements of the effective compliance program in the same year. You know, you have to take it slow. You have to, you know, start, you know, what prioritize. Uh, it's not going to be the same one year as it's going to be, you know, five years from now. So right. uh, I 100% agree. Um, so we have about five minutes left. I would love to at least show the examples of those job aids, but then, mm -hmm. you know, I want to give it to you. What are the last couple of points or the last big point we want to leave the audience with uh, for today? Yeah, I mean, I think let's let's see if we can move to a different slide here. Uh... So equipping your team, we talked a little bit about this, where we had the email, the distribution email, the job aid, the talking points and the feedback loop. Um, if this is going to be successful, you have to be able to equip your team, your compliance captains or ambassadors or whatever you want to call them to actually share the information and incentivize them to share the information with others. If they just get the information and that's it, it's not going to be effective. So making sure that it's in simple bite-sized pieces, easy for them to understand. Keep in mind the audience. If you have a lot of folks who maybe they didn't even finish high school, I don't know what your company does, but maybe they didn't finish high school. Maybe they didn't, they, they uh, just graduated from high school and that's, that's it. Um, so, so meet them where they are from an education level perspective. Uh, make sure that they uh, can take the information because some of these compliance topics are very complicated. I remember long, really? long ago when I first heard about conflicts of interest, I didn't understand what the heck that was. Of course, now, 20 years later, I know very well what conflicts of interest are, but it's hard. It's a hard topic for somebody who isn't a compliance person. So making sure that they understand that information. So, yeah, to your point, I did want to show some of the examples of the job aids that we did. Um, this is the uh, design that our intern was able to do. Um, and uh, these are just, you know, a few examples of them, but it's, it, cool. you know, it breaks it down into little bite sized pieces. It shares, you know, the information that is needed for whatever the topic is. Um, we had uh, 12 different topics that we were going to present and we were able to adjust as the risks needed. So if, uh, for example, there's a lot of gifts, gift giving, gift receiving around Christmas time. That's probably when you want to do a, you know, uh, gift and entertainment policy update and have a job aid for that and talk about that. Um, so thinking about what's important that time of year, what what's important during that month to kind of give out that information. And that's what we, where we try to um, put our calendar based on. So smart. So you had kind of a content calendar where you were releasing this content to these ambassadors to presumably distribute to their team or re-explain to their team that was dialed in kind of throughout the year. So it was just kind of plug and play. You could just send it and you weren't each month trying to remake them and stuff like that. Yep, exactly. Great. Um, how are we doing on time? So we got about two minutes left. What are your parting words? What are your words of inspiration uh, for, uh, for the ethics verse today? So I would just say to sum it all up, relationships are so important, whether it be relationships with the C-suite and the leaders of the company or relationships with the frontline employees to make them feel comfortable coming to you and, and speaking up. Uh, relationships are everything. And that's really what the Compliance Captains Program is all about, is building those relationships at the, the market level offices so that people will know what compliance is the compliance isn't the department of no, that it's the department of maybe K-N-O-W instead of N-O. Um, and, uh, you know, building those relationships so that they feel comfortable coming to you when there are major issues in the, in the company. Yeah, I mean, we're in the knowledge work economy. We are our work. The assets of our companies are human beings. 
the language of human beings is is relationships and we have to build those relationships it's literally the fastest and most effective way for us to expand our impact uh round of applause for elizabeth elizabeth this was phenomenal thank you so much for sharing so much of your uh your playbook with us um this is the year you guys this is the year 2024 is the year that ethics and compliance really moves into this 3.0 mode where we are viewed as the strategic lever in the organization. And it's going to be because people like you are here every single week. People like you are there every single day on the front lines trying to drive that organic culture of integrity forward. So i um, so glad to launch this year. Thank you, everybody who joined us. Uh, thank you, Elizabeth, for coming. This was so fun. Uh, join us next week. We've got another great topic for you. And the best thing you can do to support the ethics verse is to share on social uh, what you've gotten out of this. If there was a takeaway that Elizabeth shared today, uh, put that on social and invite other folks to come. We really want to grow this network, not just for uh, ourselves, but we want this to grow for all of us. The bigger our network can be, the more folks that we can come in contact with and the more, um, the more rich our network uh, can grow to, the more impact we're able to have, the faster we're able to move. So this is a special industry and this is a special community because of people like you and uh, just really excited for this year. So, Elizabeth, we will see you soon. Connect with Elizabeth uh, on uh, LinkedIn and we will see you all next week. Thanks, everyone.